Hey, Nets fans, on game night, there's only one food delivery service that's a real slam dunk. Grubhub's got you covered with game time eats, late night treats, lazy lunches, family dinners, and more. It's all on Grubhub. When cooking isn't in the cards, go Grubhub. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. So you pay zero delivery fees when you order. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for details. Get your food delivered on time at the lowest price with Grubhub. Download the Grubhub app today. Go for Grubhub. Got big travel goals this year? Tick them off with 15% off Intrepid Travel Trips. Take the road less traveled with locally based leaders who know the area like the back of their hand on a trip that's not just good for you, but good for local communities and the planet as well. Whether you're unwinding on a Tuscan farm stay or learning to roll pasta with the locals in northern Italy, you'll see more, do more, and go further on one of our small group adventures. So don't miss out on our February flash sale now until February 13th. Head to IntrepidTravel.com and start planning today. Listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of the podcast. And what we do here, if this is your first time here, welcome. You can maybe take a seat in the back and then, you know, get to know a few of your uh, friends around there. But we talk to people who are involved in independent music. And I'm talking punk, hardcore, indie rock, emo, whatever subgenre you're talking about. If it has originated in small, sweaty rooms and probably still exists there in some capacity, that is what we care about. And I talk to the people who have either released music or played in bands or you know took photos for scenes, whatever it is. This scene has been foundational for all of the things that uh, you know we have continued to care about in life. And this person is what I would definitely call a lifer. You know him. You love him. Moby internationally renowned recording artist in the electronic dance music scene, ambient music scene. Moby is a dude that I've always found incredibly interesting, but we are here to discuss his newest documentary. Well, I would say maybe first. I I don't know if he did a documentary before, but this one is simply titled Punk Rock Vegan Movie, basically pulling together the strings between animal rights, veganism, vegetarianism, and their roots within punk and hardcore and all of those different genres, and basically draws the straightest line possible between those two scenes and then follows the evolution of it ever since its origin stories, which is really, really cool. And honestly, for a person like myself, who's been steeped in this community for 20 plus years, I even learned some things. And plus, it's really, really fun to watch it and understand different people's perspectives on how they got involved with this and all this other stuff. So anyways, you can find a link in the show notes to the page in which you can watch the film. And it's awesome. I wholeheartedly recommend it. But Moby was uh, very kind with his time because, I mean, on a tight press junket. So we were only able to get 30 minutes, squeaked it out to 40. (laughs) We were able to make it happen. But um, that's who we got on the show this week. And uh, if you would be so kind, you the listener, If you would toss a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, if you're listening to it on there, or on Spotify, you can just click a star rating. I would greatly appreciate that. It helps this show get discovered via the uh, ever-changing algorithms that exist. And then you can also email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. Love to receive feedback, band recommendations, whatever it is that's on your mind. It is definitely something that I read and respond to on a regular basis. So, um, yeah, let's just talk to Moby. Cause like I said, very interesting dude. He has a ton of connections within the context of punk and hardcore played in a band called Vatican commandos. Like you can easily Google his involvement within the scene. I'm not going to Wikipedia page him, uh, as far as these questions are concerned, but then also just use a listener, but we get to, we get to dig deep, which is fun. And that's what I like to do here. But first, before we dig into Moby, I have to tell you about a legendary release on a very cool record label. Idan Records is proud to announce their 30th anniversary reissue of post-hardcore staple, Quicksand's Slip. This is the first time it's available on vinyl in over a decade. And this thing was released on February 9th, 1983. It's so cool that this record still 
persists and exists within the foundations of punk and hardcore and post-hardcore, whatever genre you want to call it. This is just an incredible record. And Iodine Records is a label that put out 20 releases last year and was rebirthed a couple years ago, two years ago to be precise. And I love the label. They have painstakingly put so much attention into this re-release from a remastering job to a very deluxe edition of this thing. I will include a link in the show notes to a easy place where you can find all of the different versions of this thing. But if you don't own the record, you absolutely should purchase it now. If you do own the record, like I do, you should purchase another copy because this thing sounds massive. I've listened to it and I'm like, yo, this is like, it feels like a new record, which is incredible. But Shout out to Iodine Records, and please check out the link in the show notes, and you can purchase this Quicksand Slip 30th Anniversary reissue from Iodine Records. And now, here's Moby. I specifically have been interested, and honestly, I've never seen you articulate this. Like, how you actually, and I know this sounds like a basic question, but like, how you actually, you know, kind of got into punk, like the introduction of it to you, was it um, just kind of in the air <laughs> as you were uh, well, growing up? So to provide a little bit of context, and I'm a, it's, a, it's an easy question to answer, but it's also a question that makes me confront my own mortality because it makes me realize just how old I am. Understood. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... It was the late 70s, and I was living in suburban Connecticut, and classic rock, which at the time, I don't even know if it was called classic rock, because it was just rock. It was like, you know, Led Zeppelin, The Kinks, The Who, et cetera. Like, that was everywhere. And, you know, the radio was nothing but sort of like, it was either top 40 or classic rock. And I... I liked it. I sometimes pretended to like it more than I did because I wanted to try and like fit in with the cool kids, which never for better or worse, never actually worked. But then I had two moments in particular that really stood out. Um, And it reminds me a little bit of that in the Lou Reed song, rock and roll or the velvet song, rock and roll. When he says like, you know, she turned on that New York station and couldn't believe what she heard at all. Yep. So when I was around 13 years old, one of my hobbies, because I didn't really have friends, I didn't play sports. So one of my hobbies to, to stay at home was I would sit in front of a transistor radio, which is already kind of sad, and try and record things off the radio with my grandfather's old dictaphone. So I would hold this crappy microphone up to the speaker on the transistor radio, and I thought it was just so cool that I could record things off the radio. And the DJ on WNEW played I Fought the Law by The Clash. Mm. And I had never heard anything like that. Like I had that moment of like, what is this? I'm like this 13-year-old kid in his suburban bedroom in Connecticut holding this crappy dictaphone microphone up to a transistor radio. And I taped it uh, and I taped it and I just listened to it over and over again. I was like, I don't even know what this is, but this is so exciting. It just sounded so different than anything else in the sort of like the Led Zeppelin kinks world. And to be clear, I love Led Zeppelin and the kinks. Like I am not maligning them, but at the time the clash just stood out. It was just like, like just a different world. And then, and I wish this was a cooler story, but hopefully it's kind of endearing and that it's a little bit pathetic. Um, I was obsessed with a writer on SNL called Mike O'Donohue. His name was Mr. Mike. Yep. And he put out a movie called Mr. Mike's Mondo Video. And it was basically just a clip show. And I really wanted to see it because I, I just thought he was so odd and interesting. So when I was 13 or 14, my mom and I went to a theater in Norwalk, Connecticut, and we're the only people in the theater to watch Mr. Mike's Mondo video. And one of the clips he had was Sid Vicious doing My Way. And it was the same, I had the same reaction as when I heard I Fought the Law on the radio. I was like, what is this? And so those two things were really my introduction 
to the world of punk rock. And then, of course, from there, uh, I had my friend Paul had a cool older brother who had a copy of Nevermind the Bollocks, and he loaned it to me. And I was like, this is amazing. And then my friend Dave had uh, the first Clash album. He loaned that to me. And at that point, I was just like, okay, I'm in. Like, this is so interesting and so exciting compared to Freebird eight-minute guitar solos. Right. And uh, that I appreciate the articulation of that because I think that once you start to go down the proverbial rabbit hole and everything is exciting, you're just consuming this devoid of context. Like, you know, you're not, you don't care if this is like punk or hardcore or a scene or whatever. You're just like, oh, what what's exciting about this? It's such a visceral reaction. And it just, it felt new because it was new. Like sure. it felt, it was exciting and it was fast. It was energetic. And then, you know, I discovered Gary Newman, I discovered Elvis Costello, I discovered Joy Division, you know, and so, and in my mind, it was all the same thing. Like it was mainly being made by British musicians and it was people who had short hair and it was interesting. And then I discovered Devo and I didn't know there was a difference between, you know, Black Flag and... Elvis Costello or the dead Kennedys and Gary Newman. Like I was like, it's all cool. And it all sounds great. Um, and the other super exciting thing was the sort of, and I'm, I'm hesitant to use this acronym cause it's so overused, but it was the DIY aspect of it. Like it felt so authentic. It wasn't, coming from a corporate, I mean, granted, the Clash and the Sex Pistols were on major labels, but like for the most part, the music was getting played on WNYU. Um, Tim Summer had this thing called Noise the Show that my friends and I listened to religiously. And it just, it, it, it was sui generis. It was coming from us. Like, you know, it wasn't being handed to us by adults at corporations. It was kids. Right. Um, and then like our idea of non kids, like I remember one of the first shows I saw was fear at the mud club. Um, and like, they seemed like such grown ups cause they were like 23. Right. You know, we were 16 and I went to ACE. Then we would, we discovered a seven. And I remember going to see Kraut. uh, it was like Kraut and maybe Murphy's law at a seven. And like, they seemed like such cool grown ups cause they were like two years older than us. Yep. Right. You have no, you don't have any <laughs> basis of comparison. You're just like, they're older than me and they're so much older than me because you, you know, you've got no frame of reference. You're just like, Oh yeah, they're, they're adults playing this music. Cause it's awesome. Yeah. And yeah. then and I guess it was like around 1981 or 82. Um, I went to go see minor threat at great Gildersleeves and I was able to introduce myself to Ian. And I felt like I was meeting like the most established biggest rock star on the planet. Like I enter, I remember going up to him and I was like, Mr. Mackay, my name is Moby. I'm, I'm just want to say I'm, I'm a very big fan of yours and it's an honor to meet you, sir. Right. And he was probably looking at me like, um, who is this kid? Yeah. Okay. You're 16 and I'm 19. Like what's the, like we're, we should have been in high school together. Right. Right. No, I, I, I love that. Especially. Yeah. Because you, you have that reverence for people that you look up to musically and you're going to treat them with the respect <laughs> that you feel like in your head they deserve. So that's awesome. The, I know like when you were, you know, around 18 is when you, you know, really started to obviously get into, you know, playing in bands and Vatican commandos and all that sort of stuff. And so much, like you said, within the DIY community was still being defined. Like so much of it was very hand to mouth and you guys were uh, just understanding how to, you know, get shows out there and put out demo tapes and stuff like that was uh the the DIY aspect has clearly played a very large part in your life what um i guess the through line of that community what has kept you attached to that sort of DIY mentality when clearly you know a lot of people that get into that just you know become disinterested in it but you've continued that regardless of uh what you're doing well part of it is i mean because i never expected to have a career as a musician, mm -hmm. um, I really thought I was going to spend my entire life making music in my bedroom that no one would ever hear. 
and maybe getting a doctorate in philosophy and teaching philosophy at community college. Like I really thought that was my career trajectory that, you know, cause my friends and I, we made little weird films on super eight and 16 and little demos here and there. And I DJed to 20 people a night. Like I was like, Oh, music and making weird little films is something I love, but clearly there's no audience for this. Um, and that was fine. Like I was in the late eighties, I was living in an abandoned factory. I was making about $2,000 a year, making music and little films constantly. And I was so happy because my friends were all doing the exact same thing. And I just thought this is the natural order of things. Like there are those musicians who have figured out how to have careers. And I clearly am not one of them. And I was like, okay, that's just the way it is. Like I'll make music forever. And no one will ever listen to it, but what are you going to do? That's, that's the nature of things. So every single aspect of the weird career I've had has been very surprising. And to your question, the more I've strayed from, we'll call it like the DIY approach. And I'd say DIY just sort of like, it's almost like a, a, an approach of honesty and hopefully with authenticity. And the more I've strayed from it, because obviously there are a lot of compelling forces that can lead someone away from the pursuit of authenticity, um, you know, money, fame, all the, you know, the, the classic temptations. But the more I've pursued them, honestly, and it might sound like a cliche, the more hollow I felt and the less grounded, the less happy, the less authentic, the less aligned I felt. And so, you know, some people, sorry for rambling on too much, but I'm an old person and this is what old people do. We ramble on. <laughs> um, so some people are very good at looking at a marketplace and tailoring their creativity to that marketplace. Like Daniel Miller, who owns Mute Records, we had this conversation a long time ago is he was basically saying, he's like, there are those musicians let's say like Adam Levine, like who's like, and I don't know Adam, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but like where he looked at the, the music world and he's like, I know how to succeed in that world. Um, and Daniel was like, guess what, Moby, you are not that. Like you, if you have success, it's going to be a complete accident. And if you try to pursue and accommodate that commercial world, it's not going to work out. And lo and behold, he was right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. And that, and sometimes, I mean, to your point, you have to experience the, you know, being pulled away from it to realize like, oh, no, <laughs> I shouldn't indulge that. Like sometimes, you know, you only learn by doing. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of obviously a lot of classical narrative archetypes that, that reinforce that. It's like you leave home, you go out into the world. It's the classic Dickens archetype. And then the world beats the shit out of you. And so you realize, gosh, I probably should have just stayed home. But if I'd stayed home, I wouldn't have learned how terrible the world actually is. Band merch is incredibly important to the ecosystem that we call the DIY scene. And that is why rockabilia.com is an amazing place for you to visit. And you can use this promo code 100 words or less. It gets you 10% off your order. I don't care what style of music you're into, whether you're like, yo, I'm a huge Beatles fan, or I love Iron Maiden, or how about Bring Me the Horizon, or Avenged Sevenfold. All of those bands I'm just randomly throwing out there, but they have merch for all of them. And it's officially licensed, which means the bands get paid, ships fast to you from the Midwest. It's an independently owned and operated company. I love what they do, and I know you will too. So go to rockabilia.com and get 10% off your order by using this promo code 100 words or less. Check it out and have fun shopping. And to that point, too, the you know, I know the uh, Connecticut's you know punk and hardcore scene, like as it started to blossom more in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, I mean, especially you know bands like Youth of Today and obviously Revelation Records starting to get out there and stuff like that. Um, you know, clearly there is a connective tissue that you learned from an early age of the philosophies of, you know, straight edge, veganism, vegetarianism, and, uh, you know, bands of that genre. When did you, I guess, first make that, could pull that connective tissue together yourself where it was, was it a band like Youth of Today or was it, you know, Bad Brains talking about that? How did that come into your life? It was, um, well, I mean, cause Ray and Purcell, uh, I've known them since 19, 
1981, right. I think, yeah. uh, when they were in Violent Children and I was in Vatican Commandos. Um, and we played so many shows together because the Connecticut scene in the early 80s, there were five bands. There was Reflex from Pain, CIA, Seizure, Violent Children, Young Republicans, Vatican Commandos, and No Milk on Tuesday. As far as I know, that was it. Like, that was we it? Were, <laughs> right. We wanted, and I'm not saying that as some sort of like badge of exclusivity, like, boy, we wanted more bands. But like, so we all played, like whenever a real band would come to town, we, that like the guys at Pogo's in Bridgeport, Connecticut, or Sean and Brian at the Anthrax would like get the Connecticut bands to open up for them. So like if the Misfits were playing, you know, like No Milk on Tuesday and Vatican Commandos would open up for them. If the Circle Jerks were in town, uh, Violent Children and Reflex from Pain would open up for them. So yes, yeah, so I've known Ray and Purcell. Honestly, almost it's like we're getting to it's like over forty years. Right. Um, and but my introduction to the world of punk rock and veganism was in nineteen eighty two. The Vatican Commandos. We did our first tour which when i tell you what the tour consisted of it's bit, i mean a tour in name only right so vatican commandos cia seizure and reflex from pain we got into a van and we drove from connecticut to akron ohio and we played a show in a pizza parlor for an audience of approximately six people like Beautiful. there were way more people in the bands than there were in the audience um but when we got to akron we were staying in a vegan squat. And I'll be honest, I didn't know what a squat was and I didn't, I certainly didn't know what vegan was. Right. Um, but I remember the morning we woke up in the vegan squat, this kid with like a blue haired Mohawk said, Hey, welcome to Akron. We made lentils. And like, I was like, I, what I like, I've, I've never been to Ohio before. I don't know what a squat is. I don't even know what a lentil is. Like, right. It was so confusing to me. Um, and because at the time I was this, you know, junk food eating, suburban, you know, nervous little punk rock kid. That's amazing. Um, and so, yeah, so that was that was the intro. And then I guess it was two years later in 1984, um, I had this. What in hindsight is a very self-evident epiphany is I, I had this realization that. If you love animals and you're deeply troubled by animal suffering, you probably shouldn't be paying other people to torture and kill animals on your behalf. Um, and so I became a vegetarian in 1984 and then in 1987 uh, went vegan. And so I've been vegan now for 35 years. Right. Which is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's really cool to see the uh, through line with, you know, not only how you've stayed connected to the scene at large, because I think it's probably easy for people to look at some of the actions you've taken in either in regards to animal rights or just being like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, Mo Moby's trying to be a culture vulture and like, <laughs> yeah, he's, I don't know. I don't know how punk or vegan he really is. And you're like, well, no, like here I can, I can show you my receipts and not like in a, <laughs> in an egotistical way, just be like, well, I, I something I've cared about for a long time. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, yeah, it's been a very long time and obviously musically, I mean, there's even in this in the movie we're just releasing the punk rock vegan movie. There's a scene where Bagel the dog interviews me and says, "Hey, I thought you were like Enya. Like, I didn't know you were had a background in <laughs> punk rock." So, right. like, I'm ex trying to explain to Bagel the dog, like, well, actually, I kind of grew up in the punk rock world, and you know, I've got three scars on my head from Black Flag shows, and um, obviously, a lot of the music I've made is stylistically about as far from punk rock as you can get, I have to presumptuously assume that that, that D, the, the DNA that was sort of encoded into me in the early eighties, like it's still, it's always there, you know, that like the DNA, like you go out and you, and sorry if this is completely self-evident, but like you look at the world, you question the world, you take nothing for granted and if institutions and mores in the world don't conform to your values, you reject them and you replace them hopefully with something better. Like that, that has hopefully always been with me, even when I've strayed from it, you know, like it's really hard 
once you're oriented in that way, like it's really hard to become a civilian. Like it's really hard to go into the world and embrace the world and accept the world. Like you're always, I'm sure, and again, I'm, I apologize for stating the obvious, but like you're always suspicious of institutions. You're always suspicious of self-interested politicians, corporate leaders, humans, et cetera. Like you can't not be suspicious if you grow up questioning authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're very, especially too, where like you're talking about the, once you start to make these connections because either bands or subcultures introduce these ideas to you, then you, like you said, you can't view the world through a different prism. You're only going to view the world through that. It's like, oh yes, of course, this makes sense. Like I'm going to question all these things because that's why I, my life exists as it does. Yeah, and it, and <laughs> I will say the world makes it super easy to be suspicious. Right. You know, like the like the like the world provides a lot of raw material for us to question and dismiss almost every aspect of conventional culture. Like I imagine it would be different like if you were like living in Boulder, Colorado and everything around you was idyllic and you didn't have access to news, um, maybe you could be like, oh, the world is a great place. But like for those of us who, you know, almost masochistically try and be pretty well informed, like it's hard to make the case that the world is not a complete dumpster fire. Right. <laughs> Definitely. So a thread I wanted to pull on too, in regards to uh, you know your your record animal rights, like clearly you know drew a line in the sand, not only musically but then also just made people reckon with the fact, like, oh, Moby isn't just this you know club banger dude, <laughs> and um, you know I'm sure that there were a lot of considerations from a commercial perspective before you released it, but ultimately you ended up you know putting it out there. Uh, was it one of those things where? as you started to, you know, receive the uh, critical feedback of be people saying like, oh, this, this Moby record sucks. Like, did you, uh, you know, I, I guess, how did that affect you? Or was that just like, oh, I know, I'm go I know what I'm walking into. Oh, I had no idea what I was walking into. Okay. <laughs> um, my assumption, and I remember when I just sort of decided to make that record, uh, is I had played a festival in Denmark which was not Ross killed. It was one of the smaller festivals in Denmark. And I was in the dance tent. This is 1993, 1994, thereabouts, maybe 95. And the dance tent was very kind of quiet and conservative and no one was dancing, you know, mm -hmm. was, which was fine. It was perfectly pleasant. But then I walked over to the main stage and I think it was like biohazard and Iggy pop and maybe even Sepultura were playing and, I, and, and the audience was going insane. And I was like, Oh, this is ironic. Like this is the rave, like biohazard and Sepultura were way more of a rave than what was going on in the rave tent. Like it was so celebratory and so exciting. And it just kind of reminded me like, Oh, this is like, it's, it's the spirit of things less than the sort of the form of them that is my allegiance. You know, I get, I mean, the Mies van der Rohe idea of like form versus function, you know, like we, to state the obvious, live in a culture where people very quickly, understandably identify with the form of things. Whereas to me, the function, the underlying principles are so much more interesting. So I just thought animal rights, that album, I was like, Oh, I think this is interesting and exciting. This is what I want to make. And I thought this was part of the musician's job description. Right. You know, to, to do like to prioritize the pursuit of principle over the pursuit of career. And what I learned pretty quickly is that might have worked in the sixties, <laughs> but sure. by at some point that idea was just thrown out the window. Like, you know, the, the world, whether it's the critical establishment labels, what have you, it's like they, revere consistency you know the artists who pick a lane and stay in that lane and some of those artists make great music but it just seems so like 
like, why not get a job as, you know, like marketing mufflers if that's your goal is to like pick a lane and stay in a lane. I think of that Ray Bradbury quote, like, you know, specialization is for insects. Like humans are supposed to learn how to do a million different things and not just dedicate a life to one minor little parochial concern. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's well, I, I do. Uh, yeah, I completely understand what you're talking about, especially like you said, the, the consistency nature of it. It's like that's that's what the, you know, commercial slash pop culture world expects. Like they want you to stick in that lane because that way they can extract the most value from it. Where as from an artist's perspective, like clearly that's not what we were put on earth to do, so to speak. Yeah. And it certainly I understand the expediency of it. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to name names with it because I don't want to get in trouble, but like there are, you know, bands and musicians who have been sort of doing the same thing for a very long time. And like, clearly from a commercial perspective, like it makes their careers a lot easier, like it makes their tours easier. It makes everything is easier. It's just, it seems kind of anemic to me. Right, right. Not you know, like, like the longevity of it, too. Yeah. And then, and yeah, so I just think it's, I mean, I, I never picked a lane and I'm not saying that that's a good or bad thing. It's just, I guess, again, how I'm weirdly wired and what I thought the job description was for a musician is like, you know, like you think of, you know, the clash even, you know, or John Lydon. I mean, granted, John Lydon's a hard one to reference now because he's a right. <laughs> Yeah. weird, angry Trump supporter. But like, you know, think of like from the Sex Pistols to Public Image and even like the second Public Image album is so experimental. Then the third one is completely different to that. I was like, oh, that's so interesting. Yep, totally. Um, or like when The Clash played at Bond Casino and they had Grandmaster Flash open up for them. I was like, wow, that is really challenging. Or even Talking Heads, like when they made remain in light like it was such a 180 from uh the early record and i was like okay this is what this is what musicians are supposed to aspire towards like reinvention and you know challenging your audience and at times losing your audience because guess what they might not want to go with you but that's just one of the consequences of not being predictable year after year yeah absolutely in uh in watching the documentary there, I mean, people like you and I who have existed within the, you know, punk rock DIY subculture, like we can draw the immediate line from understanding how, you know, punk rock, heavy music, hardcore is all connected within the philosophies, especially of the, you know, vegan and vegetarian movements. Um, to me, the, what you were attempting to do, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is you were trying to draw the straightest line between those two things for a person who may not have any experience with, uh, subcultures in general. Um, I, I presume that's some, uh, I guess manifesto that you were focused on in regards to putting together this documentary? Yeah. I mean, the sort of the genesis of this was about five or six years ago, I was talking to some people in the animal rights world. And none of the people I was talking to knew that a huge part of the modern animal rights movement started with hardcore and with punk rock. And I was so surprised that no one was aware of, or that very few people were aware of that. Like you were, um, some of our friends were, obviously the people who were there were, but there are so many people who assumed that punk rock was nihilism, that punk rock was basically... And I understand, like, given the way it was popularized in the 90s, like, you know, there were some meathead punk rock bands and a lot of, you know, like, look at, you know, I quite like some of the Offspring songs, but like, look at the Offspring at Woodstock 99. Like, if that's your introduction to punk rock, it's pretty easy to assume, like, oh, there are 50,000 meatheads who took a break from being frat boys to go beat the shit out of each other at Woodstock. Like, if that's punk rock, that's gross. Right. But most of us hopefully know that's the gross outlier, not to criticize the offspring. Cause I do think they're really like wrote some really fun pop punk songs, mm -hmm. but um, that I realized for most people, it's kind of like, like I remember talking to some people in the early nineties about David Bowie and 
the people I was talking to only knew David Bowie as the guy from Labyrinth and the guy in like the Let's Dance video. Right. And they're like, ew, you mean David? They like they were dismissive of him. And I was like, oh my God. But that, if that's all you're exposed to, how could you be expected to have a different awareness? And I brought some friends to an H2, I think it was H2O. I can't remember who else was playing. It might have been H2O and the Cro-Mags. I don't know. But it was a these these two vegan bands, vegan straight edge bands ostensibly. And I brought some friends to the show and they, my friends were horrified. They were like, these people are just beating the shit out of each other. And that guy's just screaming. And was, the lyrics, they're probably the most principled, thoughtful lyrics that anyone's ever written. And, but then I realized unless you're like, you know, like you or me or like a lot of people, like unless you're a 15 year old kid reading the lyrics in your bedroom, you wouldn't know what people are saying. Uh-huh. Um, and so that, so you're absolutely right. Like one of the goals in making this movie was to sort of say, Hey, guess what? There is this history that is so unexpected to most people that punk rock is so principled and so ethical and was the breeding ground for the modern animal rights movement. Right. Yeah. That it's no, it's true. Especially to, to your point, like uh, now that this, you know, uh, movement has existed for a, a long period of time, there's so many touch points that people have. And what you're trying to do with the documentary is basically <laughs> shining a light and like, hey, guys, a very important component of this whole animal rights movement has existed in here, even though you may have thought, like you said, it's just, you know, people jumping on top of each other, yelling at a microphone. Yeah, I mean, every interview I've done for the most part has involved the journalist being like, wow, I had no idea. <laughs> right. And you're and like, I'm like, oh, well, okay. Ex- except when you talk to someone who grew up with it and they're like, oh yeah, I've known about this for decades. But so it's, it's really interesting that there is such a different perspective. And then ultimately, I mean, the, the ultimate two goals of the movie were one to use whatever, creative platforms I have to try and draw attention to animal rights and veganism and try and move the needle towards a more compassionate world. Um, But also to hopefully remind people of the punk rock ethos and how desperately needed it is today. And I know that might sound like old, old cranky guy talk, but I went to this Grammy party I guess about five or six years ago. And I love staying home. Like I hate staying up after 9 PM or socializing, but I got dragged to a Grammy event and they were playing the Grammys on, on big screen TVs. And I was just sickened because no one apart from Kendrick Lamar and Janelle Monet mentioned politics. Mm, Yeah. And this was like, Trump was president. The world is collapsing. Everything's falling apart. And it's just these, wealthy musicians not rocking the boat and not taking a stand that might, you know, compromise their revenue streams or their endorsements. I was like, what happened? Like what happened to Chuck D what happened to Neil Young, the, you know, the, the spirit of the clash and John Lennon and credence. And like, where did it go? Like, like even Marvin Gaye, like this, this ethos of use your platform, use your voice, to draw attention to important issues. And it's like seeing these affluent musicians just trying to sort of like keep their careers going. It made me sick to my stomach and I walked out of the party and I was like, music should not be this, you know, music is supposed to challenge people. It's not supposed to accommodate and reinforce the worst aspects of our crappy society. You need to pull up your web browser and go to evilgreed.net because they are an amazing web store solution for bands and record labels. But how you, the consumer, can benefit from it is buying all of this awesome vinyl shirts from a very highly curated roster of bands and record labels. They honestly act like a record label because it is a very specific point of view they're trying to get across. Like, Labels like, uh, you know, uh, Sergeant House, Triple B Records, uh, they do so much cool stuff. If you are into heavy, heavy adjacent music, you will absolutely love what they have going on. And I have a promo code. Please use 100 words. It gets you 10% off your entire order. 
And what's even cooler about it is they ship it to you very fast. They're in located in Berlin, Germany, but they have a very, very easy way for you to order stuff from multiple bands, get it shipped to you, and it's super, super simple. So evilgreed.net, 100 words is the promo code for 10% off. And my rec- personal recommendation, just go ahead and buy the botch reissue of the American Nervoso LP. That thing is an amazing record, but the reissue of it, from what I've seen online, it looks absolutely gorgeous. So you can do that, just a little pro tip there. So evilgreed.net, 100 words is the promo code. 10% off your order. In regards to, it seems like, and I'm sure you can, uh, or you've encountered this, where it seems like uh, opponents of, you know, certain philosophical behaviors, whether it's, you know, straight edge or veganism or, you know, anything else, it seems like a, a zero sum game of, you know, winners and losers, um, where it's like, okay, if the whole world isn't vegan, you know, like clearly you're losing or whatever. <laughs> um, how do you kind of, you know, stack up that argument, even though it is a, a straw man argument? Um, you know, how do you kind of, I, I guess, balance that in your brain where um, you're trying to put positivity and uh, other things out there versus people who are, you know, clearly trying to bring you down a peg, so to speak? Uh, well, one thing I I remember in the late 80s, for example, having conversations both about electronic music about hip hop, about punk rock, where basically, like in the world of punk rock, for example, like you would have people who were into Mission of Burma and Black Flag and had nothing but disdain for like, you know, the, the, the people who like the police and the English beat. And I was like, yeah, no one's born cool. Like no <laughs> one is born knowing about Silver Apple's and suicide, like you have to discover it. And like, everybody is in a different place in their journey. And I know journey is a terrible word to use. It sounds like I'm writing greeting cards, but everybody's in a different place. Like, you know, and it's not our place to judge people where they are. I fully believe that. Like, because I mean, judgment is so flawed because judgment presumes omniscience. Like for me to judge someone, that means I know everything that has led them to where they are. And I know everything that they're going to do in the future. And clearly that's impossible. You know, we're not omniscient. Um, And so I feel like we have to meet people where they are and we have to respect where they are and just communicate with them and let people make up their own mind. Let people like you present people with information and hopefully by being respectful of them, they will at some point, if it makes sense, like make more rational, more principled choices. Um, and if not, you know, um, that's one of the flaws. I, I mean, we live in a, a system where we, we have to re- we not respect, but we have to allow, unless we decide to become autocrats or totalitarians, like people make their choices and we don't have, you know, like we can't change that. Um, so yeah, it's that idea of like, effective advocacy by respecting the people you're communicating with and also not criticizing fellow activists. Like, you know, that is, there's nothing worse on the progressive side, the left side, the vegan side than creating a circular firing squad. Right. That is especially, and I feel like social media especially is like, it's a breeding ground for those circular firing squads. And meanwhile, while progressives and Democrats and vegans and straight edge people are all attacking each other, guess what? The huge corporations and the anti-democratic forces are destroying the world. Right. Um, And I, I think just lastly that you also mentioned maybe like, I I think you alluded to like the sort of how do I respond to being criticized? And the truth is, I don't, I don't know anything about it because I learned a long time ago to never read reviews. I don't read comments. I don't read, I don't, if I'm on TV or radio, I don't watch it. So I know nothing about how the world might perceive me. And I love my ignorance. Like I know, sure. I know that there are a lot of people who hate me. I know that, you know, like when I make a record, there'll be bad reviews, but I love not knowing specifically that that's the case. 
because like you can't do anything about it. So why get upset about it? So I just, I have a complete almost like Stalinist blackout on anything that might be written about me or said about me. Right. Yeah. You're like, I'm fine. This, this is the area of my life where uh, ignorance is bliss. It's totally good. Yeah. Cause if something like if someone writes something nice that feeds my ego and if some, someone writes something super critical that makes me want to blow my brains out after I kill them. And obviously none of those <laughs> are right. healthy. So that's why I just, I, I cultivate my ignorance regarding how the world might perceive me. Like I love not knowing how I'm perceived. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Unless a person is right in front of you and is your friend. And at that time, that's all, that's, that's fine. That's just a discussion we're having as opposed to, you know, a yeah. random stranger. And also just lastly, what I'll say is creatively. And I, I, I hope, and I assume that you work with this idea, this approach is the goal is to keep doing stuff. And the goal is to keep doing stuff, you know, to try and presumptuously make the world a better place and to go out there and like, you can't be bogged down by critics. You can't be bogged down. And so I just categorically ignore everyone's opinions. I just keep making stuff and hope that it hopes that some good might come from it. Right. Some, some resonance will, uh, will last much longer than any sort of criticism that gets thrown in your direction. I definitely yeah, get that. I mean, yeah, or not, yeah. or maybe I'm just some like delusional pariah and people are going to like throw garbage at me as I walk down the street. I'm like, well, okay. As long as I get to keep making music and talking about veganism. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> right. It's like, okay, that's, that, that's fine. I'm, I'm introducing the conversation. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Moby, I very much appreciate you spending time with me. Thanks for uh, letting me, uh, you know, ping pong around your uh, punk rock brain. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, one, one last question for you that's not relevant uh, to what we were just talking about. Where are you based? Because when you said we were doing this at 3 p.m., that implied that we're both in the same time zone. Yes, I, <laughs> we are in the same time zone. I'm actually, yeah, I'm in, uh, in Orange County. I live in, uh, Newport Beach. And so I, you and I, I mean, we met many years ago. I used to work for a PETA for about five or six years and like just mm -hmm. existed within the, uh, you know, greater, uh, you, punk rock hardcore community and stuff like that but yeah I'm, I'm just an hour south of you oh cool well i wonder if you recognize in watching the movie where i when i interviewed um the band sect with uh oh with chris callahan yeah Crisis. oh dude for yeah, sure that, yeah i was i was at that, that, that there's like a record store skate score program skate store in orange county where they played and i drove down and they were yep. very surprised that there was no film crew it was just me with the camera and, <laughs> and the sound recorder dude i when i saw i mean it, it, obviously this this film is uh, very much up my alley and just seeing obviously all of our our mutual friends where it's just like oh there's Alyssa there's yeah anyways but yeah when i when i saw that i was like oh that's really cool cuz i went to that show a little bit later on i just didn't and hung out with chris and and scott and yeah just love them as as humans cuz um yeah they're just great people and so i was very excited to see the wide swath of people that you were able to include everybody from you know quote unquote notable vegans to people who are notable to our community, I thought was really, really cool. Well, good. Well, I'm really glad that we finally got the chance to talk. Um, and Yo, how cool was that? Moby was great. I very much appreciate him not only putting together this punk rock vegan movie documentary, but also Natalie, his publicist, for thinking of the show and wanting to reach out because, uh, yeah, I was very, very happy to have this chat. So shout out to both of them. And like I said, you can click a link in the show notes that will able, be able to take you to the spot where you can watch this film because it's very, very worth your time. Let's talk about the guest next week, Devin Swank from Sanguisabog. I'm absolutely butchering the pronunciation of the name, but uh, you will be able to obviously dive into it next week because uh, they just released a record on Century Media, Sanguisabog, Sanguisubog, something like that. You get it. Anyways, Devin is the vocalist of the band, is a perfect amalgamation of like hardcore and death metal. Like They just got all these influences coming through. A lot of Cannibal Corpse thrown in there. I just, I love the band, what they do. And I had to have Devin on. So we get into it. And that is what's happening next week. Talk about diversity, right? I mean, death metal one week. We got Moby on one week. <laughs> so cool. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Love to see it. And anyways, until then, please be safe, everybody. Got big travel goals this year? Tick them off with 15% off Intrepid Travel Trips. 
Take the road less traveled with locally based leaders who know the area like the back of their hand on a trip that's not just good for you, but good for local communities and the planet as well. Whether you're unwinding on a Tuscan farm stay or learning to roll pasta with the locals in northern Italy, you'll see more, do more, and go further on one of our small group adventures. So don't miss out on our February flash sale now until February 13th. Head to IntrepidTravel.com and start planning today. What's the worst thing about sports? That's right, all those unnecessary breaks in play. But you can make them all better by using Grubhub. Grubhub has every food you can possibly crave, from national favorites to local spots. Grab your first order from the Grubhub app or visit Grubhub.com. That's Grubhub.com. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. That's zero food delivery fees from your favorite restaurants. Visit GoForGrubhub.com slash Amazon for terms and details. Go for Grubhub. Revolt is the unapologetic voice of hip-hop with shows that shape the culture and episodes you won't want to miss. Tune into Revolt's Black News to see news from our perspective, tackling the issues that matter to our community every week. Want to know what's going on with current events, politics, and leaders we actually care about? We got you covered Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern. Then right after that at 10 p.m., Nori and DJ EFN host your favorite podcast show, Drink Champs, where the hottest stars have boozy, raw, revealing conversations, and nothing is off limits. After a few shots, of course, catch all of this and more on Revolt with Spectrum.